Hey everyone, welcome to another Facebook Live. I'm Jeff Palmer, CEO and founder and owner of Clean Machine, a plant-based fitness nutrition company. I am celebrating 37 years of being vegan. Now, what I'm going to be talking about is what did I learn in the last 37 years as being a 100% plant-based vegan? Um, dealing with society, looking at the science, I'm a science-based person. In college, I uh, was studying psycho, uh, biopsych, looking at physiology, the whole body's physiology and how it affected mood and behavior. And it was fascinating to me. I was always, as a little kid, I was always out in nature, just loving exploring the woods or the lake or finding animals and seeing how they worked with the plants and the whole microbiomes and systems that were out there. It was just fascinating to me to see how physiology works, human physiology, human brain, and natural biology worked in such beautiful harmony. And then it became confusing as an adult why human beings were so disruptive, so out of pace, so in disharmony with our natural environment, where all the rest of the natural environment, look, there are 8.7 million species of animals and humans are just one of them. Yeah, humans are an animal. <laughs> we like to think of ourselves as not. We think of ourselves above the animals, and well, that's basically not true in the true biological sense of the word. We are an animal. We're definitely not a plant. We're not a protozoa. We're not some of the single-celled organisms. We are definitely a multi-celled animal. Um, so out of the kingdoms, we are just one species out of 8.7 million, but we behave like we're the only important species on this planet. And some people will say, oh, that's because we're the most intelligent. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I I, uh, I uh, read this one. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, I don't have it up here. Maybe this one. Yeah. So in our entire recorded history, we've killed 619 million humans. We've killed each other. <laughs> Uh, there's no species uh, on the planet that has probably had that number with them. But we killed the same number of animals, other species, in just three days. 619 million animals in three days. And, and this, this we kill these animals for something that we don't actually even need anymore. You know, that's, that's amazing to me that we can cause so much pain, so much destruction to our environment, to our own health, and even kill each other. And we're called ourselves the most intelligent species. Other animals don't cause destruction to their environment like we do. Other animals don't pollute their own backyards. Other animals don't kill each other out of just disagreements. This is, this is a human thing. And it's, it's a stupid human thing, to be honest. When you look at it, humans spend an awful lot of time uh, eating things that they don't need to be eating. That is such as such is called the standard American diet. But before I go any further, let me get the disclaimer out of the way. This video is for information and educational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. So March 15th, 1985, my life changed dramatically. And that's when I'm celebrating my 37th vegan anniversary. I became vegan. I knew in my heart this was right. It never felt so right of any choice I've ever made in my life. And I'm in my 60th year of life. But there seemed to be so much information out there, even research science, so-called fact, showing that a vegan diet, a plant-based diet, a purely plant-based, plant-exclusive diet was not was not right or was not healthy or what's not as good as its animal counterparts. When I was a biopsych major in college. I was like, okay, this, this can't be true. We just must be, one, either misinformed, two, just ignoring things, or three, not looking for them. And I said, all right, well, then I am going to, since I do have a science background and, and understand the research studies out there, I'm going to look for ways. And I've spent the last 35, 37 years of my life 
combing through the research to find the answers. Now, I was into physical fitness. I was in high school. I was a swimmer, junior Olympic swimmer, AU swimmer, in, and was a record holder, a district record holder in um, uh, breaststroke. So I loved physical fitness. I loved what it did for my body. I loved what it did for my mood, my behavior. It just lifted my spirits. It made me feel great. It gave me more energy, better sleep. Everything improved in my life when I really cleaned up my diet, when I went plant-based and really kept going with my exercise. So I was thinking, okay, how do I pay this forward? How do I bring that to other people? Well, because I was involved in fitness, I immediately said, all right, well, in sports nutrition, so to speak, the two big things are protein and omega-3s, which is whey protein from animals and omega-3s from fish. Now, it's interesting as I started really diving deep into the science that um, essential amino acids actually aren't, don't originate in animals. They are created by either plants or bacteria. Animals cannot make essential amino acids. It's impossible. None do. That's bizarre that we, you know, when we ask, where do you get your protein? That's the first thing that people think of. Well, all of the protein comes from plants. It's all generated by plants. Yes, human beings can take protein, consume it, break it down, and piece it back together like a little puzzle. Yeah, we can do that. But we can't make essential amino acids. No animal can. No cow, no chicken, no pig, no fish. None of them can do that. Only plants can do that. So let's take a look at what that looks like. Here is actually how a plant using sunlight turns atmospheric carbon dioxide into glucose and then from glucose into the many different things that we use. Wood, rubber, alkaline, uh, organic acids, vitamins, minerals pulled up through the root system from the ground and converted to bioactive minerals that the humans and all animals can consume. Cellulose, fiber, essential amino acids, all essential amino acids created by plants through this process of taking sunlight, using photosynthesis, pulling in air and uh, carbon dioxide from the air and pulling nitrogen from the soil and combining that to form essential amino acids. Carbohydrates, what is that? It's a carbon from carbon dioxide and hydrate, H2O, that's water. It's exactly what it is. And we just take these compounds that are all pieced together, these molecules that human beings and no animal on this planet can do is piece them together. So let's look at what that looks like. When you look at the trophic levels, this is something I studied in college and it didn't really dawn on me till later when I became vegan. I'm like, okay, you start with number one at the bottom. That's the trophic level, that's the plants. They produce all of the nutrition for every single animal on the planet, multicellular animals. You notice something odd about this trophic level that plants supply all of the nutrition, all of the essential amino acids, all of the uh, essential fatty acids, all the omega-3, all the omega-6 that humans and all other animals require, all the vitamins, all the minerals, all except one, which one vitamin, which is actually produced by bacteria. Now, there's even a symbiotic relationship where plants can pull up that bacteria. Yes, animals can eat the dirt uh, by pulling up plants from uh, with their roots and getting that bacteria in them, but it's the bacteria that actually produce that B12. Even B12 is not made by animals. So no nutrition is made by any animal on this planet, none. Why are we consuming animals? They're not the producers of nutrition. They're not. There's the trophic level. This is scientific fact. Nothing comes from an animal. It all comes from a plant. As a matter of fact, when you get it, it's already changed forms because animals change forms of these plant nutrients into different forms. If you consume them in an animal form, some of those forms can be toxic and cancer causing. So you're not even supposed to get that. That's why we know human beings are herbivores, which is number two on the trophic scale there, the second level. All the herbivores eat plants. 
Now, you look on there and the next level is carnivores. And you're like, wait, where are the omnivores? I thought humans were omnivores. And omnivore is a made up word by human beings. <laughs> and let me explain this. There is no requirement for animals, any animal, to eat both plants and animals. You either are required to eat animals, biologically, physiologically required, and I'll get into the explanation of why that is, you're required, that's called a carnivore. And then there are other animals that are required to get their nutrition from plants. That's all herbivores. That's all there are. There's only two forms, herbivores and carnivores when you're talking about nutritional requirement. Omnivores is just a made up level by human beings to say, oh, some that eat both plants and animals. Okay, you can eat an herbivore, some herbivores can eat animals and still live a, a, a full life. Well, yeah, <laughs> but that's like saying, okay, then I'm an alcohol -ivore. I can drink alcohol and live a whole life. I can smoke cigarettes and live a whole life. That's true. It may not kill you. It may kill you. It may cause cancer and kill you. But you may be able to consume it. Just sticking stuff in your mouth and, and, and surviving is, is not a requirement. Alcohol is not required for survival. Cigarettes are not required for survival. Animal products are not required by humans or any herbivore or omnivore for survival. They're not. This is just BS. And why this has become mainstream understanding that humans are herbivore, are omnivores is beyond me. There's no such thing, really, if you're talking about the requirement for nutritional requirements for survival. There is herbivore and carnivore. So let's let's look at why those two things are different. Okay. So in carnivores, they have high acid stomach. Herbivores have a low acid stomach. Why is that? If human beings have high acid, and this we'll get to in just a second, if we have high acid, it'll actually eat and deteriorate our own body's uh, digest uh, stomach and can cause ulcers. Yeah, that's not a good thing. Their stomach lining and their stomach is designed differently. They have a very short and straight and smooth walled colon. Ours is globular, so it has more surface area. The more you fold things, the more surface area. And that's because plants move through our system very quickly. So the more surface area, the more absorption. That's why we have a really long digestive tract, where carnivores have a very short digestive tract. It's really high acid, break that stuff, that hard to break down stuff, meat very quickly and get it out of the system before it starts becoming cancerous. Ours takes up to 24 hours in transit. That can be a long time, uh, depending on, and good food doesn't take that long, but bad food can. And you don't want that toxic meat in there. One, we don't have the acids and enzymes to break it down efficiently. Two, it starts to putrefy in the system or spoil, and it takes too long to get out of our system. That's why colon cancer is the number two cancer killer of, of Americans in the United States. It's because all this meat we're eating is putrefying, is not digested properly. As a matter of fact, our, when people are eating meat, their stomach has to try to produce more acid. That's why the number one non-over-the-counter drug in the United States is an antacid. That's right, that little purple pill. Yes, the number one most prescribed drug in the United States is an antacid because we're putting in food that doesn't belong in our stomach. And our stomach has forced to overproduce acid to try to break that crap down. And why does it try to break that stuff down, that meat product that is really difficult to digest? Because our body knows if it doesn't get out quick enough, if it isn't broken down fast enough, it becomes toxic in our system. It can cause cancer. And that's why colon cancer is off the charts in the United States, because we're eating way too many animal products and it's not being broken down. That's why our digestive system is for crap. 
So I started looking for, okay, what are the proteins? And when you start looking at the proteins, you see something very stark as well. You start to see that animal proteins are really high in these uh, amino acids called methionine and cysteine. They're called sulfur amino acids. There's only two of them. And animal proteins tend to be very high in them, whereas plant proteins tend to be a lot lower. They used to think, oh, that makes uh, animal proteins better. It actually makes them 10 times worse. We now know that the lower amount of uh, cysteine and methionine is actually helpful to us, helping prevent cancers. Methionine feeds cancer cells. So that every time you eat a high methionine meat, animal-based egg, dairy protein product, you are consuming too much of methionine. What does methionine do? Methionine stimulates growth. And, you know, bodybuilders are like, oh, that's cool. I want to grow, 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 right? Well, we only grow so much without the help of drugs. Like me, I'm natural. This is about as big as I'll ever get in my lifetime. I could push it a little bit harder, but I can maintain it even to my 60 years of age. But I'm not going to grow anymore because the body says, no, we don't need to grow that. It's conservation of energy. If you're carrying more muscle than you really need to move the weights, then your body will say, that's enough. I'm not going to grow. Now, you can take drugs to force your body to overcome those natural stopgats, that myostatin that cuts off our body's production of muscle. But we don't need that much protein. So when you start putting all this methionine from this high animal protein into our system, it's saying grow, 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 because that's what methionine does. It gets into the cell and switches an epigenetic switch that gets our cells to grow. And our cells are saying, wait a minute, what's all that methionine in here? I don't need it for growth. I don't need to grow anymore. I'm an adult human being. If you look at dairy, dairy is what? Made to feed a small cow, a 60 pound calf to grow them quickly and hugely into a 600 pound animal. That's a good place for methionine and not in human beings that are already fully grown. You're not going to add that much weight. If you add 600 pounds, you're probably going to die from that. But that's the, the drink that you're drinking when you drink milk is made, is designed to put 600 pounds on an animal. You should not want that. If you do, if you're sending that cell signaling of methionine to grow, 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 what you're going to do is permanently switch on that gene inside the cell to grow and it becomes cancer. Now it starts to grow rapidly. It starts going crazy and growing all over the place. That's metastasized cancer. That's what people die from. You are feeding cancer cells. Look up methionine-dependent cancers. There's about 20 different methionine-dependent cancers, including all the top killers, pancreatic cancer, lung cancer, uh, breast cancer, prostate cancer. All these cancers depend on methionine to feed themselves and grow. Once you cut off that methionine, there's even called a methionine restriction diet where they actually knock methionine out of it. <laughs> they actually quoted in the, the big study on methionine saying that a vegan diet low in methionine could be an ideal way to prevent and, and uh, treat and reduce cancer, risk of cancer metastasis, which when it metastasizes, that's when it kills people. So there you have it. You know, the protein itself is different from the plant protein. It is different in its amino acid profile. It's not just the amount of protein, it's the type of protein. It was an amazing study that said, okay, a lot of protein consumption from plants, a lot of protein consumption from animals. The, the risk for cancer was 400% higher than if you were eating the exact same amount of protein from plants. 400% higher four times more risk of cancer from eating the exact same amount of high protein if it was from plant uh, from animals instead of plants. So it's not the amount of protein, it's what's in that protein. It's amazing. You know, another uh, factor of it is that animal proteins can trigger IGF-1 production. IGF-1 is a growth hormone. We need it as there's IGF-1 in, in breast milk even. That's to help the baby grow because you're trying to go from a baby to a big human being. That's when you need appropriate growth. When you're exercising, you need some IGF-1 to help grow and repair the cells that you're working on. So there are appropriate places for IGF-1. Though IGF-1 should trail off as you're an adult because you don't need that much, right? 
Well, when you consume animal products, it spikes IGF-1. IGF-1 says, wait a minute, I don't have a place to go. What's going on? It's telling me, my body is telling me I need to grow, grow, grow. And then my body is calling back and saying, no, no, no. And what happens is you stimulate those cells that grow, 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 right? From the IGF-1 and boom, there goes the cancer cells again. So now you've got methionine, you've got cysteine, the sulfur amino acids doing those damage too as well to the uh, arteries and vascular system, which can lead to heart attacks and stroke. Boom, there's your top two diseases, cancer, heart attack, stroke. Boom, right there. And they're caused by the actual chemical makeup of the animal proteins themselves. This is why I stress for people to try to make these change. When you exercise and consume a plant-based diet, you're putting yourself at a much greater risk for suffering through a disease state and causing your own body's death. Uh, and even if you don't die, the chemo, the cancer treatments, the debilitation, the loss of limbs, the loss of eyesight, the loss of brain cells, the damage to your arteries, do you really want to suffer through the last 20, 30 years of your life? That's horrible. I don't wish that for anyone. That's why I'm so emphatic about trying to get this information of how different plant proteins are to animal proteins. All right, so IGF-1, what if you consume, remember that study that said 400% more cancer? Well, if IGF-1 can trigger cancer cells, why is that cancer not happening in uh, IG, IGF-1 stimulated uh, uh, by amounts of protein? Here's why. When you consume a high fire or whole food plant-based diet, your body consumes fibers which uh, increase short chain fatty acids. These can do a cascade of events and trigger an upregulation through the plant-based diet of an IGF-1 binding protein. So now all that free IGF-1 that's going around and stimulating cells to grow and then causing cancer cell growth, instead, IGF-1 binding protein, because you're eating a lot of plants, comes over and attaches to it. Now it's not free. Now it won't stimulate the growth of any cancer cells. IGF-1 binding proteins up to 40% higher in those that are eating a plant pure diet. These are some of the chemoprotective effects, not including the antioxidants, the polyphenols that protect cells from damage. This is so important because that's why even the same amount of high protein in plants does not have the negative effects that high protein in animals do. It's the type of protein, it's the animal protein, not the amount so much. Now let's, let's get down into proteins, carbs, fats, and the fourth macronutrient. Yes, I am calling it out. You heard it first here today. There are four macronutrients, not three. Most people think of three, fats, carbohydrates, and proteins. Fiber is a macronutrient. So what defines a macronutrient? Macro, meaning larger, and nutrient, meaning it's nutritive to us. That's exactly what fiber does. Now, the old research was based on, hey, fiber barely digests in our system, then just gets pooped out. And that's where most of the fiber goes. Well, that's, that's true about insoluble fiber. But there's also soluble fiber that actually can go into the bloodstream, reduce, help bind to uh, uh, cholesterol, and help remove it from the body. So no, fiber actually gets in, some fibers actually get into the system as well, not just pass through as roughage. So that idea is wrong. Then the old fiber was that, well, fiber doesn't do anything. Big time, it does something. It booms our microbiome. And our microbiome then takes that fiber and eats it. Now what it poops out or creates are metabolites, short-chain fatty acids. And butyrate is one of the most important of those short-chain fatty acids. There's propionate and other ones too as well. And they have significant effects on the body. But butyrate is directly correlated to how well our immune system functions. So you're talking about fiber as an integral part through the microbiome affecting butyrate, which affects our immune system. You don't think the immune system's important? You don't think it's an important part of our survival? Oh, hell yeah, it is. Just as important as vitamin C is for our immune system. And that's a mic micronutrient, meaning small, vitamins and minerals, 
that we need less of, but we need a lot of fiber. It's measured in grams. We actually should probably be consuming about anywhere from 24 grams or more. They keep adjusting it more and more higher because we're realizing how important fiber is to our overall health, both for our microbiome and the metabolites that our microbiome produces from short chain fatty acids. You know, in looking at uh, the, the macronutrients of, um, of uh, Western gorillas out of Africa, I was studying that for a while, and it found like something was interesting. Their protein was, was, uh, was very high as a total uh, caloric uh, load uh, because they were eating dark greens, which are very low in carbohydrates. And I'm like, well, where are they getting all their energy from? They have huge amounts of uh, strength. And, and where are they getting all their energy from? Well, they were getting their energy from the fiber and digesting it in their colon and producing short chain fatty acids and then using those fatty acids for energy. So actually they were kind of close to a keto diet, very high in fat, but short chain fats created from fiber. Our body creates short chain fats from fiber as well. Now we can use them for energy source, but we can also use them to help with the immune system, to feed our colonic cells and make them more durable, to uh, in, uh, increase our uh, uh, the proper permeability of our cells so toxins don't get pulled into our bloodstream. So many beneficial health effects, reducing inflammation, especially after a workout. So fiber is super important, and it is and should be called by all scientists now the fourth macronutrient. So when you look at those nutrient levels that you're supposed to be getting that should be meeting, look at that fiber too. Now, there is zero fiber in any animal product. And I just showed you that fiber is vitally important for a healthy survival of human beings. That clearly makes us an herbivore, but that's not the only example. Essential amino acids. We have nine essential amino acids. Humans do. So do all other herbivores. Carnivores can have 10 or 11, including taurine. Taurine is not made by plants. Well, that's right. <laughs> it's not made by plants. It's made by animals. Human beings and all other herbivores make their own taurine. Carnivores do not make taurine. So taurine is an essential amino acid for carnivores. We don't, we make our own, they cannot make their own. Carnivores need to eat other animals in order to get the taurine that their body needs. Human beings have zero need for external taurine. It is a non-essential amino acid. That's why we are herbivores. Okay, there's your essential amino acid difference between an herbivore and a carnivore. Now let's look at essential fatty acids. I'm gonna pull this up here because it explains it. This is the beautiful omega-3 conversion chart that is born in every single herbivore. <laughs> Notice that there are six forms there. First, it starts out with the one omega-3 that is essential, and that is ALA. EPA and D, uh, DHA are not essential because our body can make its own. Just like non-essential amino acids, our body can take essential amino acids and make all of the rest of the amino acids, like taurine, by our own body's production. So the only one human beings and herbivores need is ALA. Now you see these top three in the blue box? Carnivores don't make those and don't use them. They start right here at EPA. That is essential, I mean, uh, essential fatty acid for them because animals make EPA and DHA dominantly. So when they eat animals, they get the ones they need. This is what a carnivore needs. This, all six, is what humans and all herbivores need. So now you see <laughs> essential fatty acids, carnivores are different. Essential amino acids, carnivores are different. Humans are herbivores, plain and simple. It's our physiology. It's our, it's our requirement for survival. There is a very clear difference. 
Now let's look at the third really obvious one, which is the microbiome. Our microbiome, it's about 70% of our digestion is dependent on our microbiome. Getting all of our nutrients into our system is required by our microbiome. As a matter of fact, microbiome helps us uh, absorb and utilize iron, helps us absorb and utilize vitamin D3. Uh, it helps bioactivate vitamin D3. It helps boost our immune system. Our microbiome is so important and it predominantly feeds on three things, fiber, number one, by far, polyphenols, number two, and oligosaccharides. And guess where they all three come from? Plants. All right. So when you create a dysbiosis in the body, what happens? You put an animal with saturated fat and animal proteins in there, and it starts to break down, and it produces, instead of healthful butyrates, propionate, and short-chain fatty acids that actually protect and boost our immune system, the animal products actually produce cadaverines and um, putrazines. That's what the bile-based bacteria, gram-negative or pathological bacteria, actually feed on dead animals. When you put a dead animal or an animal product into your system, you're boosting the bad bacteria, and they are producing carcinogenic compounds. When you put plants in your, in your <laughs> mouth, it goes down and feeds and upregulates feeds and multiplies all the good bacteria that produce all the helpful, beneficial metabolites and boost our nutrition. Really clearly, if there's nothing else in our whole physiological statement, is our microbiome is designed and made and produced for plants, period. You see it in the proteins. You see it in the carbohydrates. You see it in the fiber. Remember, there is zero fiber, zero polyphenols in any animal product. They don't exist there because they don't create them. Only plants can do this. And that's what our guts need. We are putting stuff in our bodies that does not belong there. That's why this term omnivore is stupid. <laughs> stupid. There is only herbivore or, or carnivore. You saw the, the, the path there. Where, where on the trophic level do you, see, do you see omnivore? It's made up BS by human beings who want to say, oh, this gives us permission to eat from both food groups. No, that's not both food groups. One kills you, one helps you. That's not a food group. Something that kills life isn't a food group. That's something that's like, yeah, you can drink motor oil. It may or may not kill you, <laughs> but it doesn't belong there. Oh, God. All right. So let's move along. Now, you know, some people, I've heard so many things through the years. Uh, oh, my God. 37 years of being vegan. Let's, let's, let's pull up some of them uh, right here in this one. So let's play vegan bingo. Well, where do you get your protein? The funny thing is I get my protein the same place that everybody, every human gets their protein, which is from plants. It's just some, some human beings decide to feed those plant nutrients to an animal, then kill the animal and steal their plant nutrients. That's dumb. It's wasteful and it's mean-spirited. You're killing an animal for zero reason whatsoever. All right, humans are carnivores. Well, I just explained that's just flat out not true. Physiologically, scientifically false. Cavemen eat meat. Yeah, cavemen were scavengers. They, they let, ate carcasses left behind by other carnivore animals just to get some calories in their body. They were dominantly, when you look at caprophytes, caprophytes are fossilized human poop. When we look at caprophytes, we found that they their consumption of fiber was about 100 grams a day, up to 200 grams a day. Oh my God. If they're eating 200 grams, of, the only way you can get 200 grams of fiber is if you're eating almost all plants all day, every day. I mean, the average American gets 16 grams of, of fiber a day. And these, these cavemen had 200 grams in their feces. For God's sakes, they were eating a, a ship ton of plants. 
Oh my God. Yes, they would eat almost anything to survive because they were scrapovores. They would eat anything that had some caloric value to it, a bug, a, a plant, a berry, a, a dead carcass. If there was some way to get some calories in this, we're, as a species, we're not calorie deficient anymore. That's not an issue except for extreme impoverished areas um, where they're just short of food supply. And that's more uh, a governmental issue, a more political issue than it is. We grow enough food to feed everybody in the world. There's no reason except politics that anybody should go hungry or have an insufficient calories for any reason. That's just human cruelty and human greed that is causing that. There is no reason any human being should be suffice in needing of calories. And it's funny thing, you know, and it, oh, but uh, some these people need it for their calorie index. And I'm like, okay, wait a minute. They're eating deer or eating something like a pig. Well, what are those things they're eating? They're eating mostly plants. So if the animals are eating plants and then you're just killing them to eat their plant nutrients, why aren't you just eating the plants that are there? I mean, if you're starving, why not just eat the plants? <laughs> That's what the animals that you're about to kill are eating. It just makes no sense at all. You can see how silly this argument has been for so long. Um, it's funny. Um, I'm going to put up this because uh, Dr. Kim Williams is, is amazing. He said, there are two kinds of cardiologists, vegans and those who haven't read the data. And, and that's pretty pretty much it. I mean, the the science is overwhelming now. There should be no argumentation. So, so why is it so difficult for people to change? Well, habit, culture. Uh, and for men, meat is masculinity. Men have grown up with this idea and it's been pounded into them. I don't fault men for this because it's a socialization that's fed into their brains from the time they're born. And I know I had I had struggled with it too when I became vegan is that, you know, that's not very masculine. And I'm like, what do you mean by that? I'm still just as much man as I ever was. Here I am 37 years later. I'm not, do I look less masculine to you? <laughs> Ask my wife. I don't think she'll, she'll agree with that statement. But, you know, that's just silly. It comes from this, this ideation that so many men have been locked into that power over something makes you masculine. Power over an animal, killing it and taking is the way men do things, right? We, you know, we, we play games where we beat the other team. We submit the other team into our winning, you know? We do war, we kill the other nation, we kill the other people. You know, that's what we do. We're aggressive. We're takers because of testosterone. I, I saw this uh, psychology when I was in, uh, taking one of my psychology classes in college and, and found how does testosterone work on the, the human brain? And, and they looked at, uh, they put uh, female children, infants, like uh, b between one and two years of age, and they gave them a task where they gave them a string in their hand. And if they pulled the string, it changed the image on the screen. And then they would pull it and enjoy the changing of the images. Well, um, when the, the female uh, infants pulled the chain and they disconnected it and pulled it and nothing happened, they just put down and they were frustrated and they started crying. They called for help, collaboration, right? Cooperation. This is, hey, come help me. Help me figure this out. I'm just an infant. Help me. That's brilliant. All right. But the member to try to get to an end result. We see that in politics. We see that in war. We see that in, in what we're eating. And look, guys, we should be smart enough to overcome this power over mentality. It's what leads to sexism. It's what leads to racism. It's what leads to wars. These are not good things. Power over is not a good thing. Even in business, hierarchical business, compete with your competitors, destroy your competitors, you know, make them go out of business. What is that? What about collaboration? What about cooperation? What about synergies? What about working together on projects? We can behave differently. It's up to you to change that programming. And yes, it is a male problem. When we look at research, we find that a latest study showed that 80% of all of the vegans in the United States are women. 
So why is there such a resistance for men to change? One, men refuse to go to hospital even when they're sick. And they end up dying for it at five to 10 times the rate of women do. I mean, that's stupid. That Look, there are three basic principles. One, adapt. Two, survive. And three, procreate. Those are every single cell or multicellular organism has three basic principles. Adapt to every stress or a condition that you can so that your body can survive, survive, <laughs> and procreate, which is multiply. So if you are doing things that are actually killing you and you're refusing to go to the doctor, you're not doing the basic principle <laughs> of survival of the species. And yes, well, if you are going to adhere and attach yourself to that, you are going to extinguish that. And I hate to say it this way, but that is nature's way of eliminating that attitude from the gene pool. So you don't reproduce that. If you are killing yourself, you will actually, and it even knows that, eating the animal products leads to that fatty saturation, clogs the arteries, which go to the genitalia, and reduce the body's ability to have erections. So men won't procreate. So men won't have the ability to have sex and continue on the gene pool because the body is recognizing you're making a bad choice. Don't pass that bad choice and decision-making on genetically to offspring because they'll replicate that bad choice. So if you really wanna be masculine, watch Game Changers, you'll see, you'll see what I'm talking about increase your vitality, increase your vascular health, and then it'll increase your sexual vitality as well. You'll be able to reproduce. You'll be able to pass that genetic information along to us. That is actually in our genetic makeup, designed that way so that human beings to do this. And plants can help you get there. It's just all the way. I'd like to talk a little bit about the dogmas behind supplementation, because I obviously created Clean Machine as a fitness nutrition. Because one, I wanted to help people get and gain you know, access to fitness sooner and better. Now there are certain nutrients, certain plants that can help us do that even better than food can. Now these plants, many of these herbs, medicinal herbs, therapeutic herbs are not available in our food supply, but they are available to us through supplementation. So what is supplementation? I'm going to go ahead and read this. Supplementation is, is, a, is a term that is a legal term by the FDA. The law defines dietary supplements as parts as products taken by mouth that contain a dietary ingredient, which includes vitamins, minerals, amino acids, herbs, botanicals, as well as other substances that can be used to supplement the diet. So difference between nutritional requirements of, uh, of uh, the food sources that we're eating and supplement to the diet. So yes, you can get vitamins and minerals, which can be found in foods in sufficient or non-sufficient amounts, depending on what types of foods you're eating. And there are differences in between plant foods and animal foods and the nutrition. Let's just take one example because uh, I've got lots of videos on this, but heme iron. A lot of the science has said, wow, heme iron absorbs 30% higher than plant-based iron. They used to think that was a good thing. Now we know it's a bad thing. What happens when you get too much iron getting into the system of the one? The body puts on a break by putting out hepcidin. Hepcidin's, uh, hep meaning liver, is produced by the liver. It's an enzyme that blocks iron from coming in. So once you do a heme iron load, a whole bunch of iron comes in and the body says, whoa, too much heme iron. Why? Because that heme iron is a free, ox free iron and it can oxidize. It can capture an oxygen molecule. Iron is metal. Metal's rust. Oxidation is rust. So basically that iron is rusting inside your system. Not accurately, but it's oxidizing. All right. So you got an oxidized molecule in there. Now, now it's a free radical and it's causing cellular damage, bumping into healthy cells, tearing it down because of that oxidation. That free radical then can cause damage to lots of different cells. So the body says, whoa, stop that heme iron from coming in. Now, what happens when your body does that is it puts the brakes and now heme iron up to 24 hours can't get in. Well, what happens with that iron that's free? Now it starts to oxidize in the digestive tract. 
and it creates peroxide free radicals that are known to cause colon cancer. They can even form nitrosamines are known to cause colon cancer. This is how the heme iron in meat, pork, uh, poultry, fish, all of them, all of the animal products have heme iron in it. Heme iron can directly and indirectly cause cancer in the colon, period. All of them do that. This is why heme iron is not only not better than plant-based iron. So why is plant-based iron? Well, plant-based iron does just the opposite. Plant-based iron is bound to phytate, phytic acid, IP6. IP6 can then be broken off and the iron can be absorbed when the body is ready to do it, when the body takes it up. Otherwise, it's bound and it can't stimulate cancer cell growth. It doesn't become a free radical because it's bound to a powerful antioxidant. Now, this phytate, what happens when it breaks off? Well, this phytate can go into a cancer cell and actually turn that cancer cell growth down back to normal. I did a whole study, uh, a whole video on this. If you want to find out how, how the plant-based iron actually can reverse, not only prevent and kill cancer cells, but reverse cancer cells and turn them back into healthy cells. This is the difference between plant-based iron and heme iron from animals, poultry, fish, meat. All of the animal products contain heme iron and they all, even seafood and crabs, crustaceans, all of them, they all contain my heme iron. That's what makes the red blood red. Plants have that phytate bound, anti-cancer, plant-based iron, pro-cancer, animal-based iron. It is not better. It is much, much worse. It is lethal. This is another example of why we should be consuming plants for our nutrition. It is not that that doesn't absorb enough, it's that it absorbs the right amount and that our body, the plants have bound it to phytate to make sure only what gets needed gets released into the system. We now know through a new study that just came out last year that we have been telling people to consume way too much, up to three to four times as much iron than they really need. And the WHO is adjusting their amounts and going to start putting it out soon. So you'll see iron levels actually drop significantly. Now that'll put plant-based iron back into the optimal state that it always has. And will show clearly that you're getting way too much iron when you consume animal products. When you do that too much level of high iron, just like that too much level of methionine, cancer causing very different than the plant-based sources of nutrients. It's just across the board. And you look at chlorophyll, you look at polyphenols, you look at fiber, all the things that we get from plants that have zero amounts in animal pro uh, products and animal proteins and animal flesh and tissues and <laughs> mammary secretions. And, you know, look, I get why some people out there are anti-supplement. They want to get their nutrition from food. Well, one, our farming practices have made our food supply, uh, you know, we get a lot of the minerals from the ground. When you keep growing the same plant called monocropping over and over, it keeps absorbing all the same minerals and they don't do what's called rotational crops, which put the nutrients back in there. They just put chemical fertilizers on there and it gets the plant to grow, makes them look nice and pretty and they send them off to market. But our nutritional value keeps dropping all the time. And the modern foods, even if they're organic, sometimes you're getting very poor nutritional value than what you would get in the wild. And we've come a long way because of modern farming practices. We can reverse that if we start to really understand the difference between those things. But until then, if you're not getting the nutrients in and you, there's look, you can lose, use lots of different chronometer or things like that to find out if you're getting sufficient amounts of nutrients from the plants that you're eating and adjust your diet. Find foods that are high in nutrient density. Remember, that's one of my three tenets. Um, workout intensity, workout with consistency, consistency, and reach for foods with high nutrient density. So if you do those three things, you're going to promote health in a big way. That high nutrient density can compensate for some of the issues like poor gut absorption or um, 
you know, uh, stress factors that uh, offset our, our proper digestion level, things like that. So there's an anti-supplement dogma out there. And look, I get it. There are a lot of supplement companies out there that are, are just marketing companies that are greed-based, that they aren't interested in people's health. They don't understand the science. They're just copying what other people do, put it out on Amazon, try to make a lot of bucks. I get that. And, and that's a big turnoff to me. And it's why I got in this field to try to make a difference and try to turn the tables back to real science-based nutrition supplements. Things can really help people. Bringing herbs and plants to market, like lentine, the most nutrient-dense plant ever <laughs> discovered, number one superfood. I was the first to bring it to market. And when most of the major companies still won't touch lentine, because it's too expensive, because it's too hard to explain to people, because it's dark green. And, you know, everybody just wants like a Wonder Bread of protein, wants it just isolated garbage out there. You know, I'm trying to do the right thing and I'm trying to set the record straight. I only do stuff that is backed by published human studies. I only um, put out, bring, try to bring out the best, the best source of D3 in the marketplace, the only one from organic algae, the best source of omega-3s of any plant on the planet, ahi flower. Um, these are award-winning, so you don't even have to take my word for them. You can read the science for yourself. You can see the national awards that we've won for them from our peers that also agree these are the best in class, best in class for protein, best in class for omega-3s, best in class for vitamin D3. This D3 has been two published human studies that show it actually worked within seven days to bring people from insufficiency up to uh, uh, sufficiency. Um, that's amazing. That's that's incredible. And, and from a plant source, you do not need the animal sources of D3. Well, there's lots more I could go over, but I could spend all day on here. And I'm very passionate about this. There are some stuff that I see in marketing out there. Let's let's talk about collagen real quick for a second. This this is an amazing study done by a collagen supplement company, believe it or not. And they compared it to vitamin C. And their human collagen called Humacol actually increased collagen levels by 197%. That looks pretty cool. Yeah, guess what vitamin C did? Increased collagen levels by 197%. <laughs> So guys, what's that? Their own study is showing you that vitamin C from fruits and vegetables, bell peppers or an orange or a kiwi, will produce as much collagen as actual collagen supplements do. So why are they selling you BS on collagen and why it's nutrition? Yes, it does increase collagen. <laughs> of course, you're putting collagen in the body. But you can get that on your own. Our body can make its own collagen. It just needs the proper nutrients. And vitamin C is a key nutrient. And that's why they did the study against it. But there's no different. So why are they selling you collagen? The meat industry said, wait a minute. We're throwing out all this waste product of gristle, of cartilage tissue, of tendons, of stuff like this that we can't sell as meat to consumers. We, we throw away millions of tons of this stuff. What if we could sell it to people? What if we could convince them that there's some nutritional value to it? They did the same with bone broth. All this bone marrow stuff that they're just throwing away. These are waste products. These are garbage from the animal production industry that they have cleverly put a team of marketing people together to try to convince you that you need to eat their garbage so they can make even more money <laughs> instead of just throwing it away. Now they're gonna get money from that garbage because they're putting it in your mouth. Stop already. These are bad supplement companies telling you BS when the research, as I showed you, just shows you it's no better than basic vitamin C that you can get from most of the plants. Stop buying that crap already. Now, there are amazing plants that do incredible things. and like ahi flower, which is the highest in ALA and SDA of any plant in the world by far. It's the richest source of omega-3 and 6, the two essential fatty acids, ALA and LA, of any plant in the world. That means you can consume less fat calories. That means you can get more efficient process, more efficient utilization. Head-to-head -head study with flax, four times as much conversion to EPA 
by flax than um, than flax by ahi flour. 400% increase in uh, EPA levels by this. These are amazing plants that do different things. That's what I want to bring to market, stuff that really truly has value to the consumer and, and make, those, uh, make it available when nobody else will sell it because it's too expensive or takes too much to try to educate people. It's going to spend some money. They won't be as profitable. Boo-hoo. I'm not out just for profits. Yes, we all need to make money to survive, but I mean, you can do it in an ethical way. You can actually go out and find these incredible plants and incredible products and make them available at as, as good a price as you can get out there because they are more expensive to produce, because they have science published behind them, because they've been studied in humans. That's expensive to do. And it get, gets, has to get paid for. I don't mind using these amazing ingredients. And I always use the full dose amount, like many of these other marketing companies. I see this one gram of creatine in these pre-workouts and I'm like, oh my God, people are actually buying this crap. It's gonna do nothing for you, <laughs> not a thing. Five grams is what the science is saying that you need for, for creatine. And 90% of the pre-workouts are there are loaded with stuff that won't do a damn thing for you. And that's frustrating because it makes, Makes everybody say, oh, uh, all the sports nutrition companies out there are the liars. Well, yeah, the vast majority of them are lying to you, are just doing marketing BS and to try to make you profitable, putting tiny amounts of little to nothing in there just so they can make bigger profits by selling you basically nothing and don't work. And yes, you have the right to be pissed off about that. But there are good companies out there like me, every single one. We have four patented ingredients, nothing else, not except for the flavor system, nothing else in the product, and all four clinically backed by human studies. We use the exact dose that was used in the study. We use the exact ingredient that was used in the study. There's a big difference between somebody who's actually putting out really efficacious studies that you can see for yourself are clinically proven by, by products. So I hate getting lumped in with all these marketing-based crappy supplement companies that are pulling the wool over people's eyes and pissing people off and giving them bad nutrition. But don't lump me in there. I'm doing something different. And I'm really proud of what we brought. I'm really proud of the 13 awards, national and international awards that we've won because of what we do. Yeah, I don't make anywhere near the money that, that those companies do because they're putting cheap crap in there and making a, a huge markup. My margins are really small because my expense, my ingredients are so expensive because they're, they've got studies behind them because I'm using the actual ingredients and I'm properly dosing them, whereas they're using one-fifth to one-third or even one-tenth of what I'm using in the products. 60% of our protein is whole foods. Show me one other protein out there at our price that does that. It's just not the same. And I, I'm really hoping people can appreciate that. And I, look, I'm, I'm not in this for the business. I, I am truly in it to help people. And, and that's why every single one of our protein that sells feeds a hungry child. You know, it's always my dream to have a company where I could have enough money to give back and support people who couldn't help themselves. So every purchase of clean green protein feeds a hungry child somewhere out in the world that is starving. That to me is why I do this, because it gives me the opportunity to do the right thing for other people. You get to add the most nutrient dense plant on the planet into your regimen. and by doing that, you're also helping a child survive for another day by giving them a meal, a plant, a 100% plant-based meal. That's why I love um, um, this particular company, um, Food uh, for Life, that uh, actually supplies this um, uh, process in 100% plant-based vegan meals to children only. Yeah, you know, when I look at what people think dietary supplements are and what they actually consume. It's like, I hear so many people say, oh, no, I don't take dietary supplements. They don't do anything. Oh, but I take vitamin B12 because I have to. Oh, but I take D3. Well, wait a minute. If they don't do anything, why are you taking B12 and D3? 
It's right because the B12 has been removed from our water supply. The B12 has been washed off our food supply. So we have to take B12 as a supplement. The D3, we've taken everybody from outside getting sun exposure and we put them all in buildings and corporate structures and stuff like this. So we have to now take it. We need to adjust to modern culture. That's why supplements can help. If you're looking for physical fitness, you can use herbs that aren't in our food supply. It's not found in food. And when people think, oh, I don't do supplements and I see me eating a, a donut, it's like, oh, I don't do protein powders because it's isolated protein. Well, you just did isolated protein in your donut. That's isolated protein. That's a that's the the wheat that's been have the fiber taken away from it. That's an isolated protein. Tofu is an isolated protein. Almost all the fiber and all the things. Seitan, there is no difference between seitan. Seitan is 80% protein by volume of powder because they removed all the carbohydrates and the fiber. Plant protein like pea protein, 80% protein because they removed the... There's no difference. Seitan, people think, is a food. No, it's a supplement. It's an isolated protein. Oil, they use oil on their salads all day. What is that? It's an isolated fat. Sugar, it's an isolated carb. There's no difference. If, you iso if you're if you okay with isolating a carb and isolating a fat, but not isolating a protein, what? Look, yes, it's better to get all your, your foods as whole food, whole plant-based foods, totally. But if you're going to make a, a blanket statement that I don't do protein powders because it's an isolated protein, but you are okay with an isolated fat and okay with an isolated carb, wait a minute, that's not consistent. Let's at least be consistent in that. If you say, okay, I do only a little bit of sugar. Okay, well then only do a little bit of protein. That's more consistent approach to it. And that's what I do. 90, 90 to 95% of my diet is whole food plant-based. The rest of it I get from added nutrients like branch chain amino acids to boost up that level of branch chain amino acids. Don't worry about the IGF-1 because remember, I'm 100% plant-based, so I have that IGF-1 binding protein that keeps that IGF-1 from going too much. This is why I can use the BCAs to build that muscle because leucine stimulates muscle growth, but appropriate amounts. It's just that four grams, just enough to stimulate the muscle growth. Let me show you what that looks like. Oops, do I have it? Yes, I do. Okay. Here's the leucine threshold. You see that uh, threshold down there and you see uh, the first bar is whey protein, the white bar, and that is above the leucine threshold. That's where maximum amount of leucine will stimulate muscle growth. Anything below that is not maximally stimulating muscle growth. If you see the first two bars next to the white bar of whey protein are 25 grams of soy and 25 grams of rice, and you see they're suboptimal. They are below. They're not providing enough leucine to maximally stimulate. Now, when you move over to the second three bars, and the first gray bar is whey protein with uh, five grams of leucine. Now you're way above the protein. So the leucine threshold means you're not gonna stimulate any more muscle growth, anything above that. So if you're combining whey and, and branched chain amino acids, you're getting so much branched chains, your body is just gonna blow them right out. It's not gonna use them at all because it's already meet, uh, met the maximum threshold, the leucine threshold for maximally stimulating muscle growth. But when you do ramp up the amount of soy and rice protein, now you see you've eaten enough to get the leucine to stimulate the maximum amount of muscle protein synthesis. Anything above that line, that leucine threshold line, is not stimulating any more growth. So more protein, more branch chains, more leucine is not stimulating. What you do want to do is, is, is get enough protein in to stimulate maximally. Now, instead of eating a bunch of protein, like 50 grams of soy or 48 grams of rice in a single meal, what happens if you just add branch chains to your plant-based protein? It gets you to the maximum muscle stimulus without having to eat that extra protein. And for people eating protein on a plant-based diet, that means extra fiber, extra carbs, extra fats, especially with tofu. Tofu is basically protein and fat. If you eat a lot more uh, tofu, you're going to get a lot more fat calories. So your fat calories go way up. This way, if you just ate tofu, but just added the branch chains, now you're maximi maximizing the amount of 
stimulation of muscle protein synthesis without having to add more of the protein to try to get you there. That's why branch chains can be so helpful. Branch chains have lots of health benefits. Check out my video on L-BABA, whereas one of the other uh, branch chains than leucine, which is called valine, actually turns into L-BABA. L-BABA actually stimulates the fat burning process. This is how we now know that branch chains can actually help stimulate fat burning potential. And it does it through like three or four mechanisms. People are all these different AMP kinase, all these different mechanisms that our body uses when we exercise. So you combine branch chains from plants to your, your regimen of working out. And now you're ramping up your body's ability to utilize fat for uh, muscle growth as well as you're uh, hitting that mass, maximum muscle, pros, uh, muscle protein synthesis. So these are all the ways that supplements can really help. And there are herbs like adaptogens that have therapeutic benefits that you simply cannot get from food, ex with the exception of maybe something like maca. In the uh, Pyrenees and the uh, uh, Andes Mountains, they actually grow maca, the indigenous people do, and use it as a food source. It's also an adaptogen. Uh, so maca can be an amazing food source and adaptogen at the same time. Um, but that's a rare exception. And Americans don't eat maca roots. <laughs> we don't. <laughs> Not many do, I'm sure, though. Uh, but if you can get them to a supplement, I take maca on a regular basis. It's an amazing uh, adaptogenic herb. I can feel the difference in, in consuming maca. I love it. I love the smell. That's an interesting thing. When you smell something and it smells really good to you, that's probably going to have a very favorable effect because your brain has chemistry dialed in to um, uh, make certain smells be what we should be eating. All right, so let's talk about my favorite subject, fruits then, and compassionate eating for plants. <laughs> that's kind of funny, right? And you say, oh, you kill the plants. Well, there is a way to be completely vegan, completely 100% plant-based, and not kill plants. All right, so how do you do that? Okay, so first, number one, fruits. They fall freely from the tree. When you consume a fruit, it actually is depending on you to eat that fruit and then throw down the seed somewhere else. Because if that apple falls directly under the tree, it can't grow. With too much shade, won't get sunlight, it dies. So the, the tree, apple tree is actually giving you an apple to say, hey, my baby's inside here. Will you eat the fruit? I'll give it to you as my gift if you go ahead and scatter my seed around there. Yeah, cool. Now, if we go do that in nature, that's what we would do. We would actually be part of the procreation process. We would actually be causing the plant to survive and procreate. So we'd be populating the plant. We'd be helping it to survive and helping it give birth to its children. How beautiful is that? That's why uh, the plant makes the fruit vibrant in color so our eyes can see it from a distance. Wow, that red apple on that tree, I can see it and we can go after it, right? That's why they make them brightly colors. Bananas, bright yellow, oranges, bright orange, blueberries, bright blue or purple, depending on how you color. Apples, bright red. You see how they make them bright colors. Second, they make them smell good. Don't fruits smell good? Everybody loves the fruit smells. Fruit punch, fruit, you know, strawberries, blueberries, all of them smell great. That's to get us to try to eat them. Number three, taste good, taste sweet. Why sweet? Sweet is the number one way where we get calories from carbohydrates. So something sweet can help us do that. But remember, it's got a lot of fiber in it. So most things like pears, apples, berries, these are all low glycemic because they have such high fiber in them. So they actually showed that Eating fruits, especially high fiber, low glycemic fruits and vegetables and, and, and berries uh, can actually reduce the risk of uh, type 2 diabetes and reduce the risk of cancer. And then they give you a gift on top of that. High in fiber, high in polyphenols, richest source of uh, micronutrients of any food on the planet, and bonus, polyphenols and antioxidants to help you protect your cells. It's saying, my gift to you, I'm loading this with stuff that's going to protect your cells and make you live longer and happier. All you have to do is just go scatter my seed and I thank you for it. All right. So what about some of the other vegetables like, like bell peppers? Well, that's actually a fruit. <laughs> uh, so we think of a lot of uh, fruits as uh, uh, vegetables as fruits. A tomato is a fruit. A uh, pepper is a fruit. Um, so a lot of these things, gourds, 
uh, pumpkins, squashes. Those are all actually technically fruit. Um, so you can eat those without harming the plant. As a matter of fact, as you, you scatter the seed, sometimes the seeds are indigestible. So like watermelon, watermelon will pat watermelon seeds will pass right through us. We go out and poop it out. Now it's a nice starter bed of fertilizer. Animals and humans can do that too. Starting us out, helping the plant raise that plant by putting it in a nice bed of fertilizer. If we are pooping on the ground, we don't do that anymore though. All right, but in nature, you can actually harvest the leaves, like from lettuces and stuff, by harvesting the ones on the bottom. These leaves would normally just die and fall off anyway. So by harvesting them, you're actually allowing the nutrients to go up to the new uh, leaves. To You're actually helping the plant by do this. Many animals will actually go and grab those plants because they're the first accessible, the ones closest to those. So if you eat the outside layers of the plant and keep letting it unfold and keep letting it grow, I did this with uh, like romaine. And the romaine will keep growing, keep growing, keep growing. And you can keep harvesting leaves from it, which actually helps the plant, makes it more vital, makes it stronger. And you're actually taking the greens that you need for your nutrition. So there are different ways. And remember, all of the seeds, beans, peas, beans, uh, I said that twice, <laughs> I love beans, um, uh, grains, uh, seeds, nuts, they all fall freely from the tree, from the plant. And they produce a bunch of them, knowing that animals are going to eat some of them, but like a bird will come over and, and uh, land on the ear of corn. It's got a ton of it. Now, the plant doesn't need to produce a thousand you know, things, but it can produce a thousand seeds on a corn or a sunflower has you know, even more than that in its sunflower head. It doesn't need all that. What it knows is I'm going to give up some of these seeds for your nutrition. And as the birds pecking, some of those uh, corns are actually falling off and flying off and they're actually gonna grow and re-sprout. So this is a kind of symbiotic relationship that we can get in if we harvest correctly. We can do this with the plant by helping it, helping it reproduce, helping it repopulate and actually not interfering with the life of the plant. So this is the true compassionate way. Yes, you probably have to grow your own food to do that, but if any of you do get a chance to grow your own food, that'd be a great thing too as well. All right, so why am I supplement? Why am I vegan for all these years? And you know, I, I do it because uh, I went through uh, chronic depression and somebody named Buddy Skyfeathers or Buddy Sears actually really helped me through a huge breakthrough in depression. And I felt all my suffering just be released for me. That release from my suffering said, I want to give this back. How do I pay this forward? So in meditation, it came to me, just stop harming other animals. Stop contributing to the suffering of other animals. Once I found the nutritional aspect, I, I was going to be vegan from that moment. I, I just got it instantly. I stopped doing all drugs, stopped smoking cigarettes, stopped doing anything that was going to harm my body. I didn't want to suffer anymore. And I didn't want anybody else to suffer anymore at my hands, including the animals. So that's why I became vegan a long time ago. But I'm really looking to try to help move this movement forward by showing people that even at 60th year of life, 100% uh, vegan, purely plant-based, nothing but plants, and I can get in the best physical shape, zero drug use, zero disease states. This is the life that I would want for anybody else. No suffering. You do not have to suffer with disease states if you put the right exercise and the right nutrition into your bodies. We're designed to really live into our hundreds, you know, and that's the opportunity that you have. And it's not just about the lifespan. It's about health span. So that's what I'm trying to give. I'm trying to pay it forward. That's why I created Clean Machine. And that's why I do these Facebook lives, because I really love helping people. If this is helpful to you, please like and share. Uh, please comment if you have any questions. I uh, had a lot of material to go through, so I am not going to uh, answer the questions as we speak, but I will get to all the questions. So if you want to leave questions on the video, uh, either on Facebook or on YouTube, please do. I'll, I will answer every single one of them personally. Thanks for watching. And if this is good information for you, please share so we can get more people uh, aware of the real science, um, uh, understanding how to improve their health, how to get beyond their own fears and live the best life possible. Thanks for joining me.